Buonasera. Buonasera, benvenuti a questa Good evening to you. Good evening and welcome to this 27th edition of Giovedi Scienza, Science on a Thursday. We're going to start with a meeting or a conference uh, which is on maths. Uh, well, yes, there was a time about 15, 20 years ago when the mere mentioning of maths uh, made people shudder. It was very difficult to, to suggest uh, that it should be published in papers, or s movies, or television, or even in books for popularization. Yes, there have always been books that popularize maths, but no one realized that except for those who really wanted to know it. But then there were some events uh, that changed the public perception of maths. Uh, one, I think it was 1993, the fact that one mathematician ended up uh, on the front page of uh, the um, New York Times. It was Andrew Wiles because he gave the wrong, but that uh, solution, but that was then corrected, of uh, Fermat's last theorem. The fact that the New York Times had decided that that was front page news clearly meant also for that the colleagues around the world, including the Italian journalists, uh, that there could be an interest for maths. Wiles obviously became very famous. There was a book, uh, Simon Singh's book, uh, called uh, Fermat's Last Theorem, that became a bestseller. The year after, in 94, there was the famous uh, uh, Nobel Prize uh, for economics uh, to John Nash, who was a mathematician, but who had a rather exceptional um, life story. He'd been in a mental asylum. He had been schizophrenic for 30 years of his life, and then he'd had had a spontaneous remission of the disease, and not only did he end up in Stockholm receiving the Nobel Award, but in fact he had become the main character of a movie that was called Beautiful Mind. I think those were the two turning points that then led to a cascade effect. And then there was Perlman, yes, Perlman, that's the one I want. I wanted to add that because he's a bit the hero. He refused the money and the young Young Russians have considered him an idol alongside Che Guevara, and there were T-shirts with Che Guevara on one side and Perelman on the other with the name of this author. Yes, the nicest, yes, this was much later. I think this was about 2006, wasn't it, when he refused the Fields Medal. But all the things that we were saying led to a number of the books I remember de Sautois, who came here, Marcus de Sautoy, who came here once, um, the famous uh, enigma of prime numbers, and then there were other movies who spoke about maths, for example, Will Hunt, uh, which is a very interesting book because many people are uh, no Matt Demon, but uh, they think that he was the protagonist of the main character. Of course he was. You can look at the movie, and he was the star. But uh, he got uh, the Oscar Prize as uh, the person who had written the script. He was an MIT student, uh, and it's not an isolated case. Uh, Proof was another film with Gwyneth Paltrow. Um, and then I would like to remind you that Pier Giorgio Di Freddi has al founded also the Festival of Mathematics in Rome. Yes, that was another great opportunity for three years. 60,000 people came for four days in a row to see the stars of maths, and that was the first time which, and that was surprised us uh, first year. There were people queuing and in fact even got angry if they to see. I remember one evening, for example, during the first festival, when I was trying to say, wait a minute, you'll, there'll be seats for everyone. Somebody shouted at me. I have been waiting 30 years to see Alain Kong. Well, and I looked at him and I was saying, well, certainly I would never have expected you to say that. But that, again, was a sign of the times and a sign of the fact that maths uh, was becoming more popular. Well, maybe there is by chance that there are now two consecutive ones, because next week we will have the Piano Prize and a mathematician, Alex Bellas, a very nice person, uh, who, first of all, he's a football or soccer fan. Then, uh, and that notwithstanding, 
understanding. Uh, he also he was a correspondent for the National Geographic. He went around the world. But because he was a maths graduate, a maths and philosophy graduate from Oxford, this thing of maths was uh, always interested him. So wherever he went for the National Geographic, he was also trying to find things uh, that uh, interested him from a mathematical point of view, the gorilla that could count or the tribe that had a very odd system. We'll be talking about it next week. Well, I would say that the title of this conference, which is Amazing Maths, is, uh, has been explained because everybody has been explained by all the information and by the popularity of, well, gorillas uh, with maths. That's news, isn't it? Yes. Well, I hope he'll bring it here and so that the gorilla will show us. Uh, but now, at this point, Federico Peretti will be talking about maths and games, which is the topic of his most recent book and the one but last book. In fact, he is a reoffender. We'll start with a definition of maths. Maths are like a rose. I'm not the one who said that. I wouldn't have had the courage to say it. In what way is it a rose? Well, when we talked about it with Pier Giorgio Di Freddi, his answer, because he's always a bit of an agent provocateur, is c'est une rose, une rose, c'est une rose, c'est une rose, like Gertrude Stein. A rose is a rose is a rose. Maths um, is mathematics, is mathematics, is mathematics. In fact, maths is beauty. Uh, rather than uh, being amazing, uh, maths is art, music. Um, we will be talking about this. Uh, in particular, we will be referring to it in the course of Pier Giorgio's presentation. There is this sentence by Conway, and he says, that the, is he the main mathematician, the most important living mathematician? Maybe. Well, he's certainly Peretti's idol, and I think that, uh, I hope he has other dreams too, but in his one of his dreams is uh, to be able to bring him here. I failed to, I tried to attract him here, uh, promising wonderful meals like the banya cauda. I'll be taking you to the lange, I promise. Missed him, but uh, when you told him you all, well, but unfortunately uh, he had health problems, and he promised that as soon as he's better, he'll be coming. He says that maths is sensual. I'm always surprised when I'm faced of the beauty of nature, and maths is nature. And he also talks about Fibonacci series, uh, and it explains why the petals of a rose uh, are positioned in a certain way, why they're maths. And I think uh, that I can enjoy much more than others uh, who don't know maths uh, when I look at a rose, uh, because he says, says, I know these things, and I know where mathematics lies in the petals of a rose. He's one of the idols because he invented one of the most beautiful games after um, chess. In the slide here, you can see the address, and uh, I go and check it. It's life, uh, it's called, uh, because uh, it also gives the explanation of cell automata with a very deep meaning, and Wolfram's uh, studies and the studies of many others, uh, uh, which has become one of the key aspects of mathematics. Then there's this other sentence by Peano, which is very beautiful. I always uh, try to put my other idol into it, and you know that's Peano. And it says uh, that uh, there is dogmatic teaching of, arith of notions in arithmetic and geometry, questions or undermines not only the development of intelligence, pushing it towards a vacuum. That is to say, if we merely use a formula like a litany, like a rigmarole, like a catechism, this uh, will block uh, our intelligence. But furthermore, it also undermines, it ruins uh, the moral nature which uh, then will be become one with insincerity. 
I think this sentence is very beautiful and very relevant nowadays. I also put uh, this game by a Hungarian film director. The Hungarians are very good in maths. Uh, this movie, Kitores, uh, uh, sees the main character where he, the main character gives a friend of his six matches and says, try and make four equal-sided triangles, um, each one with one side as a length, four. Well, if you look at it, it's two plus a bit. We tried to, we, we put it in the introduction uh, on the sheet that you received uh, uh, when you came in on the information sheet, but you see, it's like that. You've got to add the third dimension. In maths, you have to break what is, um, uh, in fact, pre-thought, break the circle, as we say in Italian. In fact, uh, our programs uh, at school don't do this. The syllabus, uh, as Sapeano was saying 70, 80 years ago, is still true this today. That is to say, the syllabus is still the same as we had 500 years ago. Shall we say that uh, the syllabus uh, doesn't set the students on fire? Ah, that took me a second to understand. Yes, I too now have understood it, says Mr. Bianucci. Well, so we have to think outside the square, which in Italian is to break the circle. We are immersed in numbers. Here in my pocket, I have three or four billion, billion numbers for, well, this is because all your girlfriends, is it? No, no, I asked an ICT specialist at the poly, I was going to say 200 million numbers of bytes. I thought that was a very big figure. Yes, because every byte is a number, it's a binary number, then the bytes made up of bits and bits of numbers. And for the uh, combinational analysis too, no, no, this friend of mine said there are about three or four billion. And numbers are, the numbers which politicians give us may be smaller but very dangerous. Are they very dangerous? Well, yes, we're flooded by numbers and maybe this is what has generated uh, or led to a greater interest for maths uh, among non-mathematicians. Uh, well, maths has entered our lives uh, in many unexpected, um, through many unexpected routes. Um, yes, so we try to address mathematics in a different way. That is to say, I too have been trying to do it, but my two friends have been doing it uh, better than I do, Pier Giorgio, because you know this. You try to give a body and a soul to certain demonstrations uh, to the rediscovering history. History. What I have just said is exactly the same thing as what Piero Bianucci did in this latest book. Now you're embarrassing me. No, 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 no. You've uh, been trying to prove, to offer a different demonstration of what science is. So on this uh, basis, uh, trying to rediscover a different culture. At this point, uh, having done this, with the six matches, it becomes very easy to do the same game with the 12 matches. Um, it's just enough to build a cube. It might appear self-evident, but to think outside the box or breaking out the circle, as they say in Italian, is something you don't do at school. How many of you have been playing this at school? It would be considered a waste of time. The syllabus uh, does not address these problems, and the teacher, who is forced to, in fact, uh, attain a certain result, uh, which is the equivalent of an A-level or the graduation test, uh, goes on doing that. And in the past hundred years, politicians haven't done much to change that. If we're going to talk about games, uh, let's talk first and foremost, though, about uh, the historical riddle, which... Uh, is the beginning of all the puzzles. That is to say, the Sphinx's um, riddle, the one which uh, was at the door, the gates uh, of Thebes, 
asked the passerby a question, and if they didn't answer, would have them for dinner. And this is the first of all the puzzles. So what is that being that has one voice, walks initially on four legs, then on two, and lastly on three? Well, it's a bit odd for us, but it's true, it's human beings. First of all, you crawl, that's four, then you stand and you walk, two, and then with a stick, three. Should we be teaching this at school or not? Should we be teaching this? What's behind this? What's behind Oedipus Rex? There must be this connection to show that maths starts in a certain manner. And in particular, in the Greek environment, this was so. Was this not? Well, maybe today we would have reworded it. In the end, with a Zimmer frame. Yes, uh, two. But yes, but then you would have understood who it was immediately if you talk about the two wheels and the Zimmer frame. Then this is a picture of Turner. Uh, with uh, Dido, who uh, builds a uh, Carthage, and um, she asks uh, for a piece uh, of uh, land to the uh, local king. She asks the local king for a piece of land, and she says, he says, take the hide of an ox and that'll be the space you have. Dido sliced the hide very thinly, then she needed the C2, so she didn't did a she didn't prepare a circle but a semicircle and see the difference between a triangle and a semicircle. And there's a figure, and this is an enormous problem, but which would require combinatorial analysis with maxima and minima or maximum and minimum values. And there's a number of formulas without talking about Virgil, forgetting Virgil. A maths teacher, this is Martin Gardner, another one of my idols. As a teacher, I assure you, he, he wasn't a great mathematician. I always found it very difficult to... F I liked him with when he wrote on papers, uh, because that's what we read, but his books were very difficult because they were sort of m mixed. I think his books, um, they were a bit of mishmash books, but they were published by Zanichelli. Well, they were a collection, but there were lots and lots of games, weren't they? Yes. Did you read what Martin Gardner says? Uh, if a math teacher finds uh, two young uh, uh, playing uh, with the uh, so-called Nine Men's Morris or Merrill that you all know, you shouldn't tell them off and get them to stop, uh, but you, you should ask them, maybe this game is more interesting than the one that I am doing. Just like um, the seven houses and each house has seven cats and each cat eats seven mice and each mouse would have eaten seven uh, corn ears. This was a problem that in ancient Egypt was given to the children. And it is, I can tell you exactly who could have who wrote that. This is what youngsters studied in ancient Egypt. It was, they studied also powers and that. Have you ever studied, for example, this starting with, uh, uh, and the riddle in Italian is like the one in English, there was a man with seven wives wives uh, going to St. Ives. Well, we all know the riddles, whatever language they're in, but we usually study them outside school. And uh, Nine Men's Morris, um, it started in ancient Egypt. Um, in fact, in the temple that you have uh, on the, in Kurna, uh, near Thebes, um, uh, on the banks of the Nile, on the columns, you will find some tables, three by three, of the time, so they're dated uh, back to the ancient Egypt, uh, and they used to 
play also noughts and crosses. We all played noughts and crosses. We all played like this. We used to, I always used to say, what's the mathematical interest for noughts and crosses? Yes, the next slide will tell you. I still, still put Ovid because I thought it was very important. I thought I had to, well, are you quoting him in ancient Egypt? In ancient Egyptian? Well, no, in Latin. But I think it's very important to, to quote his sentence such as um, the references uh, to the board and to a young girl. We're sorry for her if she can't play. Here, let us go back to noughts and crosses. These, this is the total number of moves that you have. Nine by eight by seven by six by five by four by three by two by one. 362,880. Then we can go back to Pascal too, but there is this dimension. First of all, let's consider it again. And then we will consider it historical analysis. Do we all agree that five, the central box, is the best one because it, it has both horizontal, vertical, and the two diagonal possibilities? So you should always start with five. Then we could say that it say that value is four. The corner ones, one, you have horizontal, vertical, and one diagonal. Three, but I know that I must go there. While the least advantageous boxes are two, four, six, and eight, because take six, for example, you only have horizontal and vertical, nothing else. But this is but the beginning of the game. Since uh, I'm a movie buff, I also had to quote at least war games. In this movie, there's a, mo there's a, a computer that goes mad. They call the, the person who built the computer, and uh, the person says, uh, well, why don't you start the computer working on noughts and crosses? Because if you follow the rules that we've just said, you will never lose. So the computer starts uh, to try and play against themsel itself uh, and uh, trying to win fails to and in the end uh, it uh, blows itself up and Earth was uh, say John Badham who is a very good film director and in the end we're all still old here well that's a very interesting example in terms of uh, the game theory because we mentioned Nash before one of the reasons why Nash was awarded the Nobel Prize is because he proved that there are always a uh, uh, Nash, uh, so-called Nash, uh, equilibria that are reached. But in the case of this game, there is a winning strategy. The first player, if he or she knows how to play, they know there is a first move that decides it. Well, not only the first move, you must continue according to strategy. But the interesting thing is that all finite games uh, have a winning strategy, either for the first player or for the second player. That is all the finite games. For example, chess have it, has it too. But in the case of chess, we don't know what the winning strategy is, nor we do, do we know whether it's the first or the second player. But uh, chess players tell us that probably it's the first player that has the opening move that has the strategy. But in fact, there are three possibilities. Either the first player has a winning strategy, or the second one, or there is a strategy that if both follow them, they'll, they'll uh, come to a Stalemate. In the case of drafts or checkers, uh, uh, you can always uh, reach uh, a point where there is a stalemate. Um, we have to change the slides and change the subject. Because, as you will have understood, this evening we are talking about uh, the G point of maths. Peretti started, first of all, you could have called uh, the Giovedi uh, Scienza, that is to say, science on Thursday. Eh, il G di cui ha parlato eh, Peretti è eh, il gioco. The G which Peretti was talking about is the Italian G for gioco, for game also in English. And I would like to talk about geometry too, but I would like to talk about it indirectly. One of the reasons why maths managed to break into uh, the area of communication is because maths has been applied to different areas. In fact, if you'd only be improving theorems, clearly, 
the audience would be less interested. But one of the ways, in one of the most natural ways, in my opinion, in which um, talk, people talk about maths uh, without showing that you're talking about it is uh, to refer to art. Artists uh, have always, at least some artists, have always been very interested in maths. And there is a moment in history, and so now we will briefly talk about history of, uh, of art uh, with the eye of the mathematician, there's a moment in maths so when maths becomes uh, fundamental when a gentleman called Brunelleschi, a famous architect, uh, who also built the dome of the cathedral in, Fra in uh, Florence, when Brunelleschi entered the artistic mathematical history of the world, there the ro rules of perspective Uh, Brunelleschi had gone uh, to mass, or something which I don't advise you to do, but in any case, uh, when the mass was over, or when he was bored with it, he left uh, and went out. And as you probably know, outside the main door of the cathedral, there's the baptistry, the one uh, which Dante used to call my beautiful baptistry. Brunelleschi looked at it, uh, probably he was relieved of the fact he was outside the church, and he said, couldn't we draw this baptistry exactly as we see it. Um, that is to say, in a way which is similar to our perception. In fact, you might think which, uh, are, that artists have always done this. What else is painting? Uh, if, uh, if not, representing on a canvas what you see with your eye. But we will see examples, the previous examples, and uh, uh, later examples. Previous painters had to try to represent what the eye had seen, but they hadn't understood how this could be done. Because uh, they had not understood the rules of this representation. And uh, these are the rules of perspective. Brunelleschi's luck uh, was to do it with the baptistry, uh, which uh, is uh, eight-sided, it's octagonal. And as you can see, both on the left and on the right, uh, that the line, not, uh, not, the, not the one in front, not the face in front, because you see the vertical is vertical, horizontal is horizontal, but the sides uh, indicating depth are not parallel parallel in our perception, but they converge towards the two points. You can see it even better. If you go on the, the square of Palazzo Vecchio, uh, which is what Brunelleschi did, and discovered that the sides of Palazzo Vecchio, which was uh, the city palace, uh, or the town hall, so to speak, at the time, they converge uh, towards a particular point, uh, which um, is called the vanishing point, uh, or which tends to the infinitive. These are not the original tables by Brunelleschi, that was 1416, they were lost, it was on wood, but he became famous amongst artists and amongst the citizens of Florence because he, the first one, the baptistry, was built at the back of a piece of wood and he, as if you could see it in the mirror, then on the front he made a hole and he used to call his friends and showed them this piece of wood and he said, look at it through uh, the hole and behind the table there was a mirror and people were looking at it and uh, through the hole they would see the reflection in the mirror of what Brunelleschi had drawn in perspective and they were all amazed at the fact that his representation was so realistic. So, what are the rules of perspective and what happened in art immediately after? Well, let me show you. This is an image of of uh, St. Mark's Square in Venice. Many of you will have been there, but very few will have noticed that it's actually not a rectangular square as it seems when you uh, come out of the portico or arcade, which is on the opposite side of the cathedral. But why does it look to us as if it were parallel and it's not? Well, because if we have understood that uh, lines tend towards the point, If we want to see them as parallel, then you have to have them diverge. So the architect that imagined the square, being aware of the rules of perspective, decided to have them diverge so that they would seem parallel for those who were looking at them. So here, in the moment in which a mathematical theory or a painting theory is formulated, no longer subconsciously but openly, uh, you can 
use it for a few tricks, and we'll see some. When Brunelleschi discovered perspective, this became the common language of all the painters for five centuries. Uh, from the end of the 1500s to the 1900s, the painters continued to use perspective to represent what they could see. In fact, they invented this particular instrument. This was the uh, perspective veil. These are two of Dürer. So this is about a century later, a century after Brunelleschi tables, that showed what uh, painters were doing at Dürer's time. That is the beginning of the 1500s. So that is to say they were trying to do what we do automatically uh, with the instrument uh, that Federico was showing with iPhone or with, for, for, with cameras. Uh, they were trying to give a photographic representation of reality reality, drawing on a veil what they could see through their eyes. This was one way of having to avoid all the calculations and to do it virtually automatically. These are the first results of the discovery of Brunelleschi's. The very few years later, the one on the right is the famous Trinity by Masaccio. It's um, 1427. And the one on the left, I think it's Boninsegna's. A few years after the discovery of the rules, you see this gentleman having a bath there in a tub. It's a marble tub. And here you see there are the horizontal lines are represented horizontally. The vertical ones are vertical. But if you look at depth, these lines of depth converge behind the bigger, so to speak, that we see in the picture. On the right, 1427. A few, only a few years have passed since the discovery that Brunelleschi had made, and Masaccio, by this point, had managed to uh, reuse it and balance it, because he managed, you see the here, the vault, which is uh, an object which is circular, it's no longer rectilinear, but uh, semicircular, in a prospectively correct manner. All painters used it, uh, this uh, trick, but they also used it when they had to paint things that were completely different. For example, but their clients would say, please paint that usual Jesus Christ or Mary or whatever. The people who had money and wanted the painting, this is by Bellini. They asked him to paint the Savior with the cross. He did this naturally, but he was also amused to put a, and put a completely unrealistic floor just for the sake of drawing in perspective a floor. And if you continue, you continue the two lines in depth, the ones towards the right and towards the left, all these lines converge towards two points. If you have a large piece of paper and you want to go and see where the two points of perspective, uh, the two uh, points, the two vanishing points end up, they end up near the horizontal part of the cross. This is what you can't see in the picture because it's part of the structure of the painting, but it's the mathematics that underlies it. So let's go and see more specifically what happens in perspective. These are the rules of perspective. I've mentioned some of them, but if you continue to do things uh, like um, if you see the horizontal lines, uh, do write the horizontal, if they're vertical, vertical, far from me. Because if there are, if there's depth, they must, it must all converge towards one point. This makes it possible for you to draw a cube or any other solid when you see it from one face. The only thing that you must uh, draw prospectively is depth. And it also makes it possible for you to draw, for example, a floor, which is not yet Bellini's, because in this case, we're looking at it uh, in a manner that it is a per either perpendicular or parallel to the tiles. But if you want to see a cube or a solid from its edge or the floor like the one before, then you have to introduce two vanishing points. That is to say, the two sides you refer to. Clearly, there's also a vertical third point which continues to remain vertical. Of course, you could have a perspective where vertical lines, too, converge to a third vanishing point because there are three lines, clearly, that determining the three directions of space. But on the whole, we don't do this because we're not used to seeing things from above or from below. But
but now say that there are skyscrapers. If you want to draw a skyscraper in perspective, then it will also have to converge with a vanishing point that corresponds to the vertical line. This is an example, one of the many, many examples, because art started to use these painting techniques rather systematically, and it's one example where there is a one single vanishing point and all the lines converge to it. Look, there are some which are obvious, uh, like the ones that you can see in your right uh, of the arcade or of the columns, but there are some that are not so obvious, uh, like the one bottom left, uh, because it's uh, here you can see uh, there is a, a step, uh, but it has to converge in the same way. And this is going back to the Trinity by Masaccio. I told you that this painting has to do with the Trinity, which means uh, that there are references to number three. Here there are two, but there are many others which can be put. There are two that are especially important because, uh, for example, the nails in the feet and arms of the person who's being crucified make up uh, a equal-sided triangle. But the eyes of the observers, too, that is to say, God the Father, who's up there, and uh, then the mother and the brother, um, as it is said in the Gospels, they, too, are looking at the scene, and their eyes are um, joined by a equal-sided triangle. And this is interesting because they form what is called the David Star, Star of David, which you can see also on the flag of Israel. Or from a mathematical point of view, what is it? It's a hexagon. It's a six-sided uh, uh, shape, but with equal-sided or equilateral triangles. It's a star-shaped or stellate hexagon. All this is something which you don't see when you look at the picture. But in fact, the interesting thing is that those of you who've seen the picture, you will observe that it's not at your, uh, the height of your eyes, uh, but you see it from below. This is one of the reasons why the vanishing point, which corresponds to the depth of the uh, vault, converges to one point, but the point is down below because it should be roughly at the level of the eye of the observer. You see how mathematics, which is very simple mathematics, will enable you to analyze paintings in a way which is a slightly different from the one which belongs to aesthetics. That is to say, to the... This has to do more with the structure of the painting. Once that they had learned how to use perspective, they may, in fact, some people misused it or used it in a different way. This is a very famous picture. It's called the ambassador. There are two ambassadors who commissioned their painting. You see, they're all dressed, and they have ermling, and um, they have symbols indicating that they're ambassadors. And there's a sort of blob down below, a suspended blob. This was drawn or painted according to the rules of perspective, so, so that if you look at it from a very special point of view of observation, something different appears. And this is what appears from down below, no, from the side. Um, the painter put uh, a skull which uh, clearly reminds uh, uh, you that you have glory and you have everything, but there is also also, uh, and um, a death, but it is an anamorphosis. That is to say, a way of uh, painting things in a distorted manner so that you can see them correctly only from a particular point of view. This is something you must go and look for because the right way of lo look at the painting is to look at it from front of it. While if you want to see the skull, you have to shift to the side. But think of paintings uh, such as this one. I don't know how many of you have have ever seen this. This is St. Jerome uh, or Jerome. Uh, this is the landscape. There are boats. Uh, you see the bottom right. There are trees and villages. I tell you where you can find it because it might be interesting, especially for you if you go with your students uh, on a school trip. If you go to Piazza di Spagna and go up the Spanish steps, um, at one point you can turn around and you see that uh, there is uh, Bruno Vespa's house and you can say, 
pay a load to him. Uh, well, because generally he's a famous t Italian television presenter and in the evening um, he works, but in the day he's at home and you continue up to the top of the Spanish steps and you'll have a church, uh, but to the side of the church uh, there is a, a staircase that goes into a convent. Uh, this convent is private, so you can't go in. But if you go to the gate, and I've done this with friends, so once I discovered this, so when you go there to the gate and you say, you say the magic word, uh, which is like a password, can I go to, obviously using Egyptian or Latin, could I please uh, venerate a martyr? And very often they'll say no for various reasons, but if you say, for example, that you're an ex-alumni, uh, no money, no money, no, 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 you say like to pray, they say you can go. Look at what Odi Freddi is prepared to do for art, and in particular to go where I shouldn't be, and to add the, to pepper the holy water with the devil. You go to the first floor, but instead of going to the chapel where Mata is and where you should give your rosary, supposed to say your rosary, there's another door where it says private. You open this door, obviously, because in any case you've already penetrated in this. Not always a door open, because once I went there and I really had to go to the uh, for the rosary, you go to the door and you find this drawer, but you will find it on the left. It's a very long wall. You don't see it like this, but you see it like this. In fact, you see it much better. It's St. Jerome. You see this representation of St. Jerome, but um, it is uh, the most example example of uh, anamorphosis because it's completely distorted. What did the painter do? The painter painted from uh, the front, uh, distorting the image so that it could be distorted. Um, not so perfect, but that you could see it uh, as a completely different image. These are the rules of anamorphosis, and this is the reason why you do it. In fact, if you want to draw some images on a, a wall and they're very high up, you'll have to distort them, because if you don't do them in a distort manner, when you look at it from down below, they would appear to be distorted. This is what happened to Phidias when uh, it is said that he brought the statue that was supposed supposed to go on the top of the Acropolis, on the top of a column, and everybody's all laughing and saying, this time he must have been drunk. Look at all this distorted statue. But he knew why, because they pulled it up. They pulled it to the top of the column, and when they put it up above, where it was supposed to be from down below, it looked as it should have been. Um, Michelangelo, though, may, Michelangelo had fell for this. He was not a mathematician. In fact, he made fun of mathematicians who use mathematical techniques. He used to say a compass is something you should have in your eye, not obviously that you should have a compass in your eye. But in his case, yes, because uh, the vault of the Sistine Chapel, um, when you go and see the Sistine Chapel, you can lie down, for example, because there's hardly any of them there, and you can look uh, uh, at the ceiling of the vault, and you will realize that the first part uh, the one that Michelangelo painted first, that all the figures are all distorted, they're not right, because he hadn't got a compass in the eye. He thought he had, but he didn't. And as you know, he painted on scaffolding, so he painted what he saw. They took the scaffolding and he said, oh, I got it all wrong there. But as you couldn't do it again, slowly, as you move along and you move towards the other side of the room, they are modified so that you can see them. But after a few years, he he understood this, uh, and this is the universal judgment. This, uh, uh, once again, appears to be distorted because uh, generally, uh, once again, it's uh, photographed from a scaffolding so as to be able to have this enormous wall with uh, all in one picture. You can see these semi-naked man as God is usually represented because up there it doesn't mind because nobody looks at him. This uh, semi-naked man is enormous and distorted compared to the other figures down below. You see how they're much smaller. Um, why? 
this time this is a mistake because this is the way in which Michelangelo drew it. But if you look at it from down below, for example, when there is a conclave and maybe you're bidding as a place as a pope or when you go with your students, you look at it from down below, this enormous man that you can see up there with all those who surround them and who are all deformed, as you can see from down below, and look as if they're the same proportions and, uh, uh, as the souls that may be blessed or damned. I skipped this image, which may be the best example of anamorphosis in a church. You see what a mathematician, an atheist mathematician has to do? Go around churches. But this is uh, the Church of Jesus, uh, which is on the Jesus Square, where there was also the headquarters of the Christian Democrats, uh, but it's also the headquarters of the Jesuits, uh, as Jesuit come from Jesus. You go inside and there's a Jesuit painted called Andrea Pozzo, who was probably the world champion of uh, these anamorphoses. A, a wonderful ceiling, and it apparently doesn't look as if it's one if you look at it from down below. And you think that there is no vault and that there is only this uh, triumph of Saint Ignatius, and you see that all the lines converge towards him. You are helped uh, by finding uh, the right point where you've got to look it for, because down below there is a sign, and in fact, uh, to avoid the problems the Jesuits have put a mirror so you can look at the painting from down below in the mirror. But these are the reasons why people invented anamorphosis uh, to exploit to the most the regles of perspective uh, so that you can paint uh, things uh, in a realistic manner. The last uh, and brief mention which I wish to make to painting and mathematics, uh, which is contained in a painting, is uh, jumping into another century. This was the, the 17th century, the Seicento, with Andrea Pozzo. This is the end of the no, the 20th century. I said that they were used uh, for five or six centuries. In fact, uh, those who were drawing without perspective were considered bad painters. But at the end of the 19th century, uh, art starts to seek free freedom. It wants uh, to uh, leave and abandon the rules. And this is a Van Gogh. Van Gogh, it's uh, 1888, and it's his room, the room in Arles. This painting at this point is dreamlike, and where things appear to be suspended. There's nothing which has to do with perspective. Van Gogh says in his letters to his brothers, I want to paint a painting that uh, will give everybody a feeling of being an outsider. And then uh, there's the sketch. And you see the sketch down below? It uses perspective because Van Gogh obviously was a painter who knew what the rules were and decided that he wanted to distort the rules of perspective to produce a painting which went beyond this mathematical study. Um, the same year, he enjoyed doing things like this. Here you can see the right, the sketch and the painting. You can see the staircase which in, on the right is drawn perfectly while on the left it too is distorted and likewise the same here can you see this underpass uh, where on the right you can see the two uh, vanishing points which converge while on the left once again but it seems that Van Gogh has had too much to drink uh, absurd or something like that is impressive. Is like. Now, what happens when you try to distort the perspective? Well, we said right at the beginning that painters always try to represent things as they saw them, but they didn't know what rules they were. So let us look now at this sh these shapes. In the part above, uh, there are arrows, uh, and we try to represent uh, them in perspective. Uh, please note uh, that the arrows are bidimensional, and since a reality is uh, three-dimensional, while we represent it on the bi-dimensional one. In the case of arrows that are bi-dimensional, we represent it on a straight line. If we have a point of view, which is where all these rays converge, we have our point of view, and we look at the beginning and the end of each arrow. When we represent these arrows on this straight line, all these arrows remain as arrows, but they converge all towards one central point. Below, you see the representation of cubes in perspective, which I referred to earlier on. But what would happen if instead of representing arrows on a straight line, we were to represent them on a, an arc of a circle? Why would we do this? Because we would like to possibly represent reality instead of representing it on the canvas, on the sphere. 
a part of a sphere. Which part? Well, for example, our retina. There might be someone, well, how does the eye see the images of the external world if the eye is made a sphere? So these are the rules so that you see the arrow, so that's always the same, the point of view is the same, but instead of projecting it on a straight line, it is projected on an arch. There are very many arrows, they're not all aligned, and what happens? The two by two, the arrows converge to a point, and these points are not always the same point, they're different points, but the, all the points are on a straight line. Instead of being a, a point perspective or a point vanishing point, it's a, a converges towards an axis, and this is the representative, and this is what the brain does when, yes, exactly, this is what psychologists do when they say, what can you see on the retina? But the interesting thing, I'll show you a photo, is that if the camera, instead of having one vanishing point, as it does uh, to show us uh, things uh, as you've seen it after the correction of the brain, if they were to show it as the retina sees it, uh, here, you would see here a rectangular room, and this is what would appear in our eyes. You see that there's an axis that is fixed uh, at the center. All the other axes uh, converge towards this one instead of remaining from parallel or converging to one point. And the interesting thing is that we've discovered also, once we've understood these uh, rules of uh, projection on a surface, uh, on a spherical sphere. This is uh, what <laughs> painters did before Brunelleschi. And here I'll just show you, give you two examples. This is Giotto, where below there is the, the usual representation, you know, friars in Francis asking the Pope uh, the, for permission to establish his own order. But we're not interested in that. We're interested above, uh, looking up to the sky, to the heavens, and see what there is. There are a number of parallel, sorry, very Li various lines, and these lines converge two by two to a point, but these points are not always the same, but they are aligned along a vertical axis. This is Duccio da Boninsegna, I think, again. Here there's some people who are having fun and eating, and they're having nice dinner. They don't know that it'll be the last supper, but uh, uh, maybe the food wasn't very good, but uh, if you look up, uh, concentrating on important things, you see that once again, the lines of depth converge on points uh, which uh, are not a single point, but which are aligned along an axis. And um, discovery of discoveries, uh, we discover that our eye has not a geometry, but many geometries. Because if we look at a square and we look at it at an average distance, uh, what does average mean? Well, it depends on the, the size of the square. But if you look at the blue square, this is what we see. It's a Euclidean uh, square. And this is the reason why Euclidean geometry was the first one to be developed. But then, if you look at this square a bit too close, if you, in fact, put your hands right near to your eyes now, but you can do it too, and you actually look at what you can actually see without blocking those automatic readjustments of the brain, you'll see that your hand is completely distorted. And the, the square would also be completely distorted, a rather uh, dome-shaped towards the outside, because geometry close to the eye is a spherical one. It's a, uh, the large angle you can do it today with, uh, um, with the cameras, not a 50 um, millimeter, but for example, using a 23, 28 millimeter lens. And if you go too far away, you have the opposite effect. That is to say, there's a distorted square, but it's in the other direction. And you have an example of what is called hyperbolic geometry, which is what happens with telelens or zooms. 135 milliliters, 200 millimeters. And this is very interesting because it helps us understand that Kant, for example, was wrong. Kant believed that we saw the world through our a priori. And clearly that is right because we see it in particular through the visual system. He also believed that that geometry, Euclidean geometry, was connected through these a priori. Uh, he, we saw the world like this because this is our perceptive system. Well, now we have discovered that this is not at all, because uh, we can see all three geometries, the spherical one, the Euclidean, the hyperbolic one, simply by bringing objects uh, too clo closer or more distant to our eye, or else uh, photographing them using 
different types of lens, which might be normal lens, um, fish eyes or great, great angles and tele lenses. Uh, and this was just a general overview of the link between maths and art. But you see that a little bit of maths, uh, parallels, uh, converging points, vanishing points, axis, make it possible for us to look at uh, art in a slightly different way. Of course, art can be beautiful or not beautiful, regardless of the rules that is being used, just like music, for instance, uh, can be Bach uh, or Telemann, uh, although it uses the same rules, or Mozart and Salieri. But, uh, however, those who are not acquainted with the structural rules uh, of musical music or of uh, art will be losing uh, most of what the painter or the musician knows about, uh, and very often they're playing about just like uh, the picture of the ambassadors, uh, uh, which means that only those who know are acquainted with anamorphosis or perspective uh, can see. Thank you very much. Grazie. And now let us go to see the other point of view. Mathematica sorprendente, quindi confermato il titolo.